Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream of our services here at Calvary Community Church this morning. Obviously, these are unique circumstances and it's a privilege to be with you, to worship the Lord together, to hear from the Lord and what's on his heart for today. I've been using, as I've mentioned at the beginning of all of our services in the season, the devotional guide, Seek God for the City. It's a wonderful prayer guide to help us to pray faith-filled prayers for our community and our nation. And I'm going to begin that way, and then Joshua's going to lead us in worship, and then we're going to have some time around his word. So let's enter into a spirit of prayer, asking God to bring forth justice in the city. Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit on him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth. O Father, send your servant to the cities of this earth. We may have ignored him, but he has long been at work, and he will never stop. He has outlasted every compromised king and every corrupt judge. He is heaven's chosen one, mantled with the Spirit of God. He has been charged to bring forth justice, and he will not fail. We may have overlooked him because he does not campaign among the rich, nor does he foment revolution among the poor. Instead, he is a healing leader, transforming the weak to become like him. We pray for his mission to be accomplished in our city. Oh, let us be found with him, serving among the forgotten and broken. Put his spirit upon us as well, so that we can labor with him faithfully in hope. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Luke 18, 8. Will you find faith on the earth? The answer, O Lord, is yes. When you come, you will find many of us believing you with our prayers and our actions. So today we pray for you to bring forth justice for those that are abused. And we pray for Christians to pray and labor with persistent faith in this hour. And we pray for the churches in Houston and across the nation today that are meeting. May we be people of faith and action, standing with you, rising above fear with your grace and mercy. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship together.
see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. So I'll never stop seeing. I'll never stop praising.
faithful.
Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall and the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Holy One dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob, he is our fortress. Lord, again, we join with other saints from across the globe today to worship you, to declare that you're our hope of glory. You're our faithful one. You're our refuge and strength. You are with us, even in trials and tragedies and difficulties. And Lord, this morning, we choose not to fear. We choose to come to you. And we choose you because you have chosen us. We declare that you're the Lord Almighty, that you are with us. We declare that a mighty fortress is our God. Lord, we bless you this morning. May you be exalted here. May you be exalted across this planet today. And may you be made known for who you are in every way. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, Joshua. Well, this is a unique opportunity for us. This is our first live stream. And so we're actually believing that God has opened up a door for us, one of the redemptive opportunities in the midst of dealing with the coronavirus. And so I have posted on our website an explanation of what we're doing today. Um, obviously, there has been an appeal that has been made by our leaders in our community and across the nation and to honor them and to express solidarity with other believers and other churches. We're doing church by live stream today, so that's what we're doing today. And we've entered into this time. Again, it's a step of obedience. It's not out of fear. And you can read all about that on our blog at calvaryhouston.com. And we've posted that on social media in other ways. Um, and this is a learning opportunity for us, by the way. I don't know how the, the live stream is going. I hope it's going really well. But we're learning like we couldn't get our YouTube to work this morning. But we at least have Facebook, and then we'll do better next week. So it's a great learning opportunity. I want to make some announcements, just make you aware of some things. So first of all, uh, we're not having services live this week or next week. We're doing them on the Internet. So again, next Sunday morning we'll be doing that. So from Monday through next Saturday, we are actually have a rest week. That's what we call those times when we take off from all of our different meetings and our different plan scheduling. We do that occasionally, but this time uh, we're doing that uh, purposefully here, uh, dealing with the coronavirus. So... We're not having any ministry activities or special events or meetings this week, this coming week. We'll have another online service on Sunday, March the 22nd, instead of gathering here at Calvary. I want to let you know that we have a workday planned as we get ready for Easter. That has been rescheduled from Saturday, March the 21st. We've rescheduled it to March the 28th. And by the way, the ladies are still having their ladies retreat on March the 28th, so you'll want to sign up for that. And I want to encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offerings in this season. You can give through our website or you can write a check and mail it to the church the old-fashioned way, whatever you want to do. But I want to encourage you to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. One of the things that we do in our services is we actually build in times to pray for other churches. Today, we're praying for First Metropolitan Baptist Church and their pastor, Pastor John Ogletree. And, but we're going to not only pray for Pastor John, we're going to pray this passage for all of the congregations around us. We pray that the God of hope would fill this congregation with all joy and peace as they trust in him so that they may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we not only pray this for Pastor John Ogletree and First Met, but Lord, we're praying this for all the believers across greater Houston and beyond. Lord, we're asking that you, our God of hope, we pray that you would fill believers with all joy and peace 
as they trust in you, so that we may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, especially in this time, this time of dealing with crisis and changes in different circumstances. We pray for your grace, and we pray this for Pastor John Ogletree and First Metropolitan Baptist Church, and we pray this for the believers here in our city and beyond, and we pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. This morning, I'm going to speak on the subject for such a time as this. I wanted to share some verses, and I wanted to share some thoughts with you that I have concerning what the Lord is saying and doing in the midst of this current crisis regarding the coronavirus or COVID-19. I believe that the Lord has an impartation for us today of courage, of faith, and of grace. So I'm believing God to do a spiritual transaction by the power of his Holy Spirit for us today. And so, first of all, I want to say God wants us to realize that you and I were made for such a time as this. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Esther chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verse 14. And then um, we'll read that in just a minute. But I also want to reference Acts chapter 13 verse 36 It says there that David served the purposes of God in his generation. I believe that you and I were made for such a time as this. I believe that God has us and is working with us and is here for this critical hour. Queen Esther discovered that she was made for such a time as this when she faced annihilation and when her people faced annihilation. So the context of Esther chapter 4 is this. There were key players. There was King Artaxerxes. So King Artaxerxes was the ruler of the Persian Empire. And then there was Mordecai. Mordecai, he actually raised Esther when her parents uh, passed away. And then there was one named Haman, who was actually anointed to the highest place in the government, in the Persian government at that time. So what happens is that something transpires between Mordecai and between Haman, and Haman gets King Xerxes to make a decree, an edict to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews and to plunder their goods. And when Mordecai heard this, he was distraught. He tore his clothes and he and he put on sackcloth and ashes and he went about the city wailing. Those are all things to say. This is serious and this is this is unprecedented because. Literally, the decree said that it was to kill, to destroy, and to annihilate his people, including the plunder of them. And so Esther finds out that Mordecai is in this time of mourning and finds out the reason. Mordecai gives the report to her about what's going on. And then Mordecai says to her, he says, I urge you to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for his people in chapter 14, verse 8. Well, Esther, Queen Esther comes back and says, wait a minute. Wait, you don't just go into the king's presence. You have to be invited into the king's presence. That's actually an edict. And to go into the inner court without being summoned is a death sentence unless he has mercy and extends his scepter to spare your life. She said, it's been 30 days since I actually went and into the court to see the king. And so you've got to be kidding is basically what she says. And then let's pick it up. And we're going to read from verse 13 in Esther chapter 14. He sent back this answer to Esther. Do not think that because you are the king's house, you are alone of all the Jews. You alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to this royal position for such a time as this. And so that word of encouragement transformed Esther. She went from being scared and being reticent to get in action to asking Mordecai and and to communicate to all the Jews that we need to do an absolute fast, three days, no food and water, and y'all pray with me. And she said, I'm going to go to the king even against this law. And she says, if I perish, I perish. But, But Mordecai carried out her instructions, and God gave her favor. We read the rest of the story. 
According to Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16, and in many other verses, it is, it is our lives. We are actually created for such a season as this, for such a time as this, and it's our time to preserve and to season like salt. It's our time to shine. It's our time to share good news. It's our time to pray. It's our time to stand in the gap. It's our time to do warfare, to love, to serve, to lay down our lives and to point people to the one who is our hope, our redeemer, our savior, our deliverer, our champion, our healer, our resurrected Lord, and our soon coming king. Oh, I believe that you and I were made for such a time as this. And I also believe that this is an opportunity to learn how to exercise our faith and our courage muscles right now. I think that we have faith muscles. I think that we have courage muscles. And I think that God wants us to develop those. It's just like our physical body. You have to, you have to get into an exercise program or you have to do some things or our muscles atrophy or we become weak or they don't do what they should. We need to learn to exercise our faith and our courage muscles now because we're gonna need those muscles when things really ramp up. In other words, we've not seen anything yet. Now, I don't mean that to discourage us, and I don't mean that to condemn us, but I do want to challenge us. According to Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, we need to grow our faith and courage muscles because God says if you can't keep up with the footmen, how are you going to keep up? With the horses. We read in Jeremiah 12, 5, if you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? And if you stumble in the safe country, how will you manage in the thickets by the Jordan? I like how the message translation communicates the meaning of that passage. It says, So Jeremiah, if you're worn out with this foot race with men, what makes you think that you can race against horses? And if you can't keep your wits during the times of calm, what's going to happen when trouble breaks loose like the Jordan in flood? And again, we've been talking from Matthew chapter 24 for the past couple of weeks. In that passage, the Lord says at the end of the age that there's going to be an acceleration of different trials, tests, and troubles And the scripture says, starting in verse 6 of Matthew 24, you're going to hear of wars nearby and revolutions on every side with more rumors of wars to come. Don't panic or give in to your fears, for the breaking of the world system is destined to happen. But this is not the end, it's just the unfolding Nations will go to war against each other, kingdom against kingdom. There will be terrible earthquakes, seismic events of epic proportion, horrible epidemics and famines in place after place. And this is how the first contractions of the birth pains of the new age will begin. Or the NIV says, this is just the beginning of the birth pains. You can expect to be persecuted, even killed, for you'll be hated by all nations on account of your love for me. Then many will stop following me and fall away, and they'll betray one another and hate one another. And many lying prophets will arise, deceiving multitudes and leading them away from the truth. There will be such an increase of sin and lawlessness that those whose hearts once burned bright with passion for God and others will grow cold. But keep your hope to the end, and you will experience life and deliverance. Yet through it all, this joyful assurance of the realm of heaven's kingdom will be proclaimed over all the world, providing every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. And after this, the end of the age will arise. So I believe the Lord wants us to learn to exercise our faith and courage muscles now. Let's practice now because things are going to ramp up in the coming decades, the coming years, and and we need our faith muscles and our courage muscles for that. Then number three, practice casting all your anxieties and concerns upon the Lord. This is from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. Practice casting 
all your anxieties and concerns upon the Lord. This is what the scripture says in 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. And I like how the Amplified kind of amplifies this verse and kind of helps to give some meaning to it. Cast the whole of your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns once and for all on him. For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. In this time of trial and trouble, you and I can trust the Lord. We can depend on him. We can bow and surrender to his ways and to his wisdom and to his timing. We can make a choice. We can choose to believe that he cares for you and he cares for me. And one of the ways that we humble ourselves is by choosing to cast our anxieties upon the Lord through prayer. We can make this declaration through our prayers, of what God says. So I believe that God wants us to practice casting all our anxieties and all our concerns upon him. Then Psalm 46 has been an important passage for me in times like this. We need to declare that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46. Declare. Declare over your life, declare over your family, declare over our city, declare over our nation, this planet. God is our refuge and strength. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Let's read Psalm 46 together. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake, With their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress or our stronghold. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease and the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This passage, this psalm was actually the inspiration for Martin Luther's song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. God is our refuge. God is our strength. And actually, I prayed this passage for my own life. It's helped me to, in the midst of my life, in the midst of busyness, I used to be a type A, very driven personality, but this practice of stopping, of being still, of, of stopping my mental activity and all my activities to know that he is God. And, and it's counterintuitive, isn't it? That I will be exalted in the earth, I'll be exalted in the nations when you stop your activity because it helps us to get perspective. Well, I didn't know this until recently as I was doing a study on this passage. That phrase, be still and know that I am God, is actually plural. The Lord is actually speaking to the nations that are in uproar, to the nations that are all messed up, and he's actually speaking to the nations. Think about that. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted in the earth. I will be exalted in the nations. And so... We declare today that our God is a mighty fortress. Psalm 46 is a passage that I just go to regularly. In the midst of any type of crisis or difficulty or trial, it just breathes strength and courage to me. Another psalm that I use is Psalm 91. I want to encourage you to pray Psalm 91 over your life, your family, and your community. I want to encourage you to pray Psalm 91 over your life, your family, and your community. Let's look at a few verses from Psalm 91. Verses 1 to 6. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow 
of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Skip down to verse 14. Because he loves me, because she loves me, declares the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in the day of trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The Lord wants those words to not just sit in our brains or sit on the surface of our ears. He wants those words to go deeply into our hearts, into our spirits. I will rescue you. I will protect you because you acknowledge me. Because of our relationship, when you call upon me, I will answer you. I will answer you in the day of trouble. And this is such a day, isn't it? Such a day of testing and trial and trouble. I will deliver you. I will honor you. I will satisfy you with long life. And I will show you my salvation. He is our Savior. Psalm 91, I just encourage you, pray that. Declare it over your life, over your family, over our community. Speak these words and ask the Lord to stand with us and to fight for us. Joshua chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. God wants us to be strong and courageous because the Lord is with us wherever we go. The Lord wants us to be strong and courageous Because our God is with us wherever we go. We'll read that together, Joshua 1, 6 to 9. And again, we're reading these verses because this is what the Lord says in times of trial or difficulty, uh, battles and challenge. These are things that God wants to be making up who we are to inspire us. He wants to impart to us today faith and courage and grace. That's why we're reading these verses, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. And we're praying, even through a live stream, that there's a transaction between God, between God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to us today and meeting with us. And I pray that you will receive faith and courage, grace and strength today. Joshua 1, 6-9. Be strong and courageous because you'll lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that I gave my servant Moses and he gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Why did the Lord command Joshua to be strong and courageous. Why did he keep commanding him not to give in to terror and to discouragement? Because we struggle with fear and discouragement. Because it's easy to give in to fear. All through the Bible it commands us, don't be afraid. That is an open door, a highway for the enemy to torment our lives. And so in the midst of coronavirus, in the midst of turmoil, in the midst of economic shaking, in the midst of whatever you're going through personally, I mean, with the crash of oil, I mean, prices have gone down, and it's impacting our community significantly in greater Houston and in other places. In the midst of all that, God speaks to us, and he says directly to you and me, be strong, be courageous. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to terror. 
You can trust me because I'm with you. May the Lord give each of us physical strength for this day, and may he give us heart strength, courage for days ahead, for the days ahead. Another thing I think God wants us to know and wants to impart to us is he's encouraging us to live in a place of faith and wisdom in all of our responses to crisis. Live in a place of both faith and wisdom in our responses to crisis. These are not mutually exclusive. Romans chapter 14, verse 22 to 23, verse 23 actually says, whatever is not of faith is sin. We need to be a people of faith and wisdom in our responses in the midst of crisis. Listen to this passage, Romans 14, 22 to 23 in the message translation. Cultivate your own relationship with God, but don't impose it on others. You're fortunate if your behavior and your belief are coherent. But if you're not sure, if you notice that you're acting in ways inconsistent with what you believe, some days trying to impose your opinion on others and other days just trying to please them, then you know that you're out of line. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Isn't that a great way to say that passage that says, if it's not of faith, it's sin? Listen again. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then for you, it's wrong. So I believe the Lord wants us to come to a place of both faith and wisdom. I think in the midst of this crisis, there are some practical things to do. There are wise things to do. For instance, we're heeding the, uh, the appeal of government and medical officials to not gather this Sunday and next, and many others across the country are responding to that appeal to congregations. They're not telling us to stop preaching the gospel and stop worshiping the Lord. They're just asking us to help in the midst of this crisis to flatten the curve, uh, the curve a little so that they can have a chance to catch up medically. So what we want to do is we want to be a people who live in faith and we exercise wisdom. Exercise wisdom. Have you seen all the pictures on, on Facebook and social media about the empty shelves in the stores? It looks like a ghost town. It's amazing. And so obviously there's all sorts of reasons for that. But my goodness, yes, we need to be wise. But we need to be wise and we need to get in action and reflect our faith. I want to I say please communicate to others what you need in this hour. Some people want to be hugged and touched, and then others don't. So it's okay to share with someone what you need and what you want in this season. If you're concerned about a compromised or a weak immune system or because of potential vulnerability for yourself or others, then feel free to do what you need to do in faith and as an exercise of wisdom. For some people, that will mean self-isolating, or limiting participation in events like church services and meetings for a while. And then I want to encourage you to listen to the instructions and heed the directives of your medical doctors and other professionals. I want to say you have permission to do what you feel that you need to do. Now, for me personally, I'm still making the decision to lay hands on people and to hug them if they give me permission to do so. So I'm, that's just a part of my nature. That's a part of my assignment. I'm still going to hug people. I'm still going to lay hands on them and pray for them if they give me permission. And we always ask that. We teach that in our ministry team training. And if someone says, hey, for right now, don't do that, I'll pray an authoritative, powerful, de declarative prayer over them, and I'll do it long distance, right? I'll do it with some space between us. I know there are legitimate and practical reasons not to touch people, not to lay hands on people, and I will respect what someone says and what someone expresses to me. So what we want to do is we want to live in a place of faith and wisdom in our responses to the current crisis. Then I also want to say, please pray for your leaders and all those in authority. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 4, the Scripture says, I urge then, first of all, that request, 
prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and all holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We need to pray for our leaders and all those in authority right now. First and foremost, and hear me, pray for your leaders and those in authority, not against them. This is not a chance, this is not an opportunity to judge or to curse. We pray for our leaders, for God to give them wisdom and godly counsel and divine insight. Can you imagine the burden that leaders are carrying, whether it's at the political level or whether it's at the church level or whatever? We need to be a people first and foremost. Pray for. Oh, Lord, bless our leaders. I used to ask people to pray for me, and then I heard some of the prayers they were praying. So I began to give instruction. Pray for blessing. Pray for anointing. Pray for protection. Pray for courage. You know, we want to pray for our leaders, not against them. We don't want to judge. Then I want to say in this hour, give mercy and give grace because you and I need grace. You and I need mercy. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. And Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. The scripture says in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So I want mercy So I'm going to show mercy. I need grace, so I'm going to give grace. Then Matthew 7, 1 to 2, years ago, Jack Deere preached a message here, and he said, I'm going to preach today on the most disobeyed passage in the whole Bible. And, man, I was racking my brain. I've been I've studied the Scripture since I was a little guy, and I've been a part of church services and training, and I was thinking, I wonder what the most disobeyed Scripture in all the Bible is. And then he said, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 to 2. Do not judge, or you will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Now that's scary for some of us. If we're critical, if we're judgmental. So right now, I want to release lots of mercy. I want to release lots of grace. I want this to be one of my guiding principles, one of my operating principles for my life because I need mercy. I want it measured back to me. I want grace. I need it measured back to me. Then last Sunday, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to the message online about this is an occasion for our testimony. From Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Revelation 12, 11. I want to point you back to that sermon because I believe it was an important word. I think that message is very significant and very timely for us. Then I want to say something about dealing with sickness. I want to tell you, treat all sickness as an enemy. Stand in the gap against it and pray the opposite of what you see. I treat sickness as an enemy. Now hear me clearly. I'm not saying that all sickness comes from the devil or from our spiritual enemies. I'm not saying that. But I treat all sickness as an enemy. It's not a part of the kingdom of God. In the beginning in the Garden of Eden or at the end when God puts heaven and earth together in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Jesus showed us what he does in response to disease and sickness. And so I want to say, treat all sickness and disease as an enemy. Pray against it. Stand in the gap against it. And pray the opposite of what you see. The Lord Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, deliver us from evil. There is a war. There is an adversary. There are enemies opposed to us in spiritual places. God wants to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are inclined toward him. Ephesians teaches us, the book of Ephesians teaches us to believe right, to live right, and to fight right. There are principles of warfare, and in my notes that I've made available online for the message today, There are different weapons that we can wield. There are different things that we can do in identificational repentance, praying out of our authority in Christ. But but the one thing I do want to emphasize is this. Use the principle of replacement, praying the opposite of the work of the enemy and brokenness which you see. 
That comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in earth, in me, as it is in heaven. Use the principle of replacement, praying the opposite of the work of the enemy, whatever the enemy is or the source of the enemy and the brokenness that you see. So if you see fear, pray for faith and courage and grace. If you see hatred, pray for forgiveness and mercy and love. Whatever you see happening, intolerance, pray for understanding and patience and grace to let others think what they feel and what they need to say, think, feel, and believe. So pray the opposite. It's, it's the principle of replacement. So those are just some things that I think are really important in this hour. In the midst of this crisis, you and I were created for such a time as this, just like Esther, just like David, just like the apostles. And I believe that you and I were created for such a time as this. I want to close by just making some comments. I personally am concerned for those impacted by the shutdowns related to dealing with the coronavirus. I'm concerned about those who are cut off from caring people because of self-isolation or from the relationships that they need. I'm concerned for those who have hourly jobs and they've lost their opportunity to work in this economic downturn, to work during this crisis. I'm concerned for those who are single parents who are trying to figure out how to manage life when their daycares are not available or the schools are not available, they're impacted by the closure of schools and daycares. I'm concerned for those who have businesses that are hurting because people aren't buying their products, aren't going to their restaurants, or aren't frequenting, frequenting their establishments. I'm concerned for those who have lost opportunities to fulfill their dreams like College athletes who can't pursue their dreams in their sporting events. I just can't imagine working up to that for years and losing that opportunity. And I'm concerned for those who have traveled and who are now stranded in different places. Those are realities that we're facing. And I, I, I don't know why, but I just feel that burden. I'm also saddened by some things. I'm saddened by people who are fueling panic with their words and their actions. I'm saddened by people who are overreacting to people who are overreacting. To overreact to someone who's overreacting is overreacting. I'm saddened by people who are looking to blame someone for what's going on. I'm saddened by those who are dismissing the concerns and the cares of others. I'm concerned for people who don't have loved ones near them. They don't have good neighbors or a loving church family to care for them in the midst of this crisis. I'm also saddened by those who are criticizing leaders and who are having just a tough time. It's a difficult time to make decisions. It's a difficult time. And there are people criticizing and condemning. I'm saddened by others who are judging people for what they think, feel, or believe, what they need to do in this hour. I'm saddened that some people are being tormented by or ruled by fear and have no source of faith, have no source of hope, have no light for what they're facing. I'm saddened by people who have lost much in the stock markets and in the collapse of oil prices, maybe even their job. Those are different things that sadden me. So there's things I'm concerned about. There are things that sadden me. They inform my prayers. But I'm also amazed at the people who look at this crisis and see opportunities or they're being creative in the midst of very trying circumstances. And the coronavirus is an illustration. For instance, like streaming our live streaming our services. This is something I've wanted to do for years and years and years. And with Michael McGee's help and the help of others, we're doing it. I don't know how it's coming across on Facebook, and we're hoping to get up on YouTube, on YouTube but I'm excited. It's an opportunity. I'm amazed that people are seeing opportunities like visiting places owned by or employing people from East Asia in order to show their love and support rather than being racist or judgmental, they're actually going to establishments of people from a different ethnic group, especially one that 
that people are making comments about and being afraid of to support the, the businesses, the employers, or the employees. I'm excited about people who see this as an opportunity to share their faith with others who are discouraged and fearful, not in a judgmental way, but in a supportive, loving, and caring way. Some people see the opportunity and they're taking the time to find ways to care for neighbors and to reach out for others. It's an opportunity for us, isn't it? Like volunteering to serve others through food distribution, through grocery shopping for them, running errands, helping at assistance ministries or in different ways. This is an opportunity. People are being creative and being helpful in the midst of this trial. Some people are being very helpful in posting helpful suggestions and resources on where to find trustworthy information regarding the coronavirus and how to deal with it. I want you to hear that operative word, trustworthy, right? Not everything you read in social media and on the Internet is trustworthy. And I've got a list of some of those resources. And then some people see this as an opportunity to practice how to show up in a reflective, thoughtful way rather than being ruled by reactivity or anxiety or fear. I've even, in my notes, I've given some addendums, and there's some great questions there on how to be thoughtful rather than reactive and anxious. Oh, brothers and sisters, I believe that you and I were made for such a time as this. I believe that the Lord wants us to serve his purposes in our generation just like people of faith have done throughout history. Let's learn. Let's grow. Let's develop greater capacity to follow the Lord in the good times and in the hard times. Let's give grace to ourselves and let's give grace to others in this season. And let's rise up and join the Lord in his fight against evil against evil like demons, disease, and discouragement, and welcome his kingdom on earth. I believe that that's what God created you and me for. And we can stand in an opposite spirit, filled with Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. You and I were created for such a season as this. Let's pray. Lord, I've shared a lot of thoughts and a lot of things. Lord, I pray not just for information, but I pray for impartation. I pray for a spiritual transaction for us that you would release by the power of your Holy Spirit, faith and courage. I pray that there would be grace circulating in our lives. I pray that you would cause us to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I want to learn from this experience. I, I want to show up better. And Lord, I thank you for what we're learning. I thank you for the opportunities that we have. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that you do not abandon us. You do not give up on us. Thank you that according to Isaiah 57, we have the good news to declare that our God reigns. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we acknowledge you today. We worship you today. We confess we need you today. Without your help, we are prone to anxiety, to terror. We're prone to fear and discouragement. We're prone to just quit and give up. But that's not who you've made us to be. So, Lord, I pray today for your help. I pray for those that don't know you, that don't have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that they'll awaken to how much they need a relationship with you, the living God, that you came not simply to save them from their sins, but you came that we might have life. You came to make us a part of your eternal family. You came to adopt us, to buy us back. You came to make us kings and priests to serve our God. You came that we might have relationship with God our Father, with the Lord Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. Now I'm praying that people in this hour will hear the good news of the gospel, the kingdom of God, and respond. Lord, I'm praying for that. Lord, I'm praying that we will be agents of blessing. Agents of blessing. Thank you that we were made for such a time as this. We worship you. 
We love you and we bless you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in whose name we pray. Amen. I want to say thanks again for joining us for this live stream. We'll be back next week. The notes are online. I pray that you'll take some time to connect with people. I gave some ideas in the information that I post on the website and in social media. Maybe some ways to connect with people remotely to process what we've shared today. And I pray that you would have an impartation of strength, grace, and mercy, and that you'll be an agent of the kingdom of God in this hour. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.